Our guest in our first segment is uh, Delegate Elliot Pritt, who joins us via telephone. He's a delegate out of the 50th. Elliot, good morning to you. Thanks so much for joining us. No, thank you, Mr. Mario. I appreciate you having me on this morning. And good morning to you, Mr. Stubblefield, Mr. Gilstrap. Hope you're doing well. We are doing well. This formality, I'm uh, I'm kind of don't know how to respond to the formality. Well, I, I, I said with last names like uh, Stubblefield and Gilstrap, I thought I was getting introduced into a Tolkien novel. I wasn't sure. Was <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Welcome to the show. <laughs> well, right, thank you, thank you. Certainly, certainly on the dark side. <laughs> Well, we appreciate your formality, especially with Bill, because as a retired admiral, he does make us salute him before the show begins each time he's in. They, Which, and you know, Elliot, for no reason they complain because of standing attention for about 45 <laughs> minutes before we get started. No, just don't lock your knees. That's right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's correct. I, I have been told that before by a friend of mine who was a state trooper, state trooper and he said uh, mm. when you would do funeral duty, you had to stand at attention for long stretches of time. He said, the key is don't lock your knees. Yeah. If you do, you'll no, pass yeah. out. When, when I was in boot camp, you had guys falling left and right. Mm -hmm. Don't lock your knees. <laughs> yep. What what branch of the service were you in, Elliot? Uh, I was in the Air Force. I was enlisted. I served for a little more than six years. Mm. Well, thank so, you for your service, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I did aircraft maintenance, so. You know, I got to fix what the guys with the college degrees broke. That's you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, what kind of aircraft did you work on, Elliot? Now, I worked on MC-130, so AFSOC aircraft, and uh, my specific job, I was in charge of uh, fixing and repairing the radar suite on those planes. Did you say the AC-130? MC-130. MC-130. Yeah. Yep. When did you begin your political career? No, oh, uh, I was just elected last November, so I've been in just short of a year. And you hadn't run for any local offices or anything before that? No, no. What inspired you to run? Well, you want an honest answer, or a <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> you want an honest... So I, I felt like at the time um, the representation that we had was not adequate, and I'll just be polite and leave it at that. Did you unseat a Democrat or a Republican? No, Republican. All right, very good. Yeah, Elliot, uh, you uh, you ran as a Democrat, and f mm -hmm. uh, five months into your office, you shifted to Republican. I I never question anybody why they want to ship mm -hmm. uh, ship parties. I I left my party as well, but I did it after I left office. Why did you do mm -hmm. it so soon after you were elected? Well, I've got two terms, right? Or I've got two years mm -hmm. in the term. Yeah, mm -hmm. and. I have the time that I have. The people that I represent have needs, and they need to be represented as best as possible. And with a Republican supermajority, you know, that's the best way I can represent the people in my district. And, and truthfully, politically, that's where my people are, too. Uh, you know, when I was door knocking, when the number one question I'm getting knocking on doors is, you're not a Democrat, are you? Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty obvious, like where the political tides have shifted and uh i was raised in a republican family so it wasn't so much a shift for me it was more of like a coming home story i believe sure how did you how did you overcome door knocking to people who were saying you're not a democrat are you and yet winning an unseating republican as a democrat well i'm a veteran right and so i checked some boxes that i think put some people's minds at ease there were some other things going on in my race as well. I don't want to comment on them here, but it's we won. It was razor thin, but we won. I want to talk to you about uh, the House bill dealing with discipline in the classroom, school buses, and such, 2890. And yes, sir. Uh, you recently wrote a column stating your concerns that you didn't think that administrations across the state were notifying teachers and bus drivers that this was an option and that they could pursue this, that for some reason, whatever it was, uh, this was being information held back. How did you glean that information to confidently write this article? Yeah, so for me, when I have discussions with teachers, right, teachers I know across the state, I'd bring it up. I'd say, hey, you know about this. Do you know you have these options? No. News to me. That's always the answer, Right. And uh, I'm pretty involved in the AFT as well, and I'm the building rep for our for our union at our building. And it was the same thing I was hearing from them too. It's you know, no one's telling us that this is an option. 
And as all of a sudden in the WEVIS, the West Virginia Education Information System, is where we document everything as education professionals. Uh, all of a sudden, there's new behavior codes popping up. And so I started having concerns that they were trying to find loopholes around how to specifically document this stuff to basically trigger the trigger the mechanism in this law that would put kids out of school for a period for bad behavior. This is John Gilstrap. So, and you think that yes, this sir. is <clears throat> just kind of going through this article here. You think that the it's not being disseminated because by by enforcing the law it creates an administrative burden for the school administration. Is that is that part of the problem? Uh, yeah, I believe so, and it creates a burden on the county board offices too. What is that burden? And it, so the burden is having to deal with something called ratification. I mean, so many ratifications. I mean, it's it becomes. There starts getting, there's flags that start getting thrown up, right? Are these kids students? Are they minority students? Are they from poor socioeconomic conditions? And the demographics in my county, 76% of the kids in our school system come from below poverty line households. And so these are questions that start getting asked, and they're fair questions, right? Um, but, I mean, it's just reached a point where as an educator, right, I teach 7th and 8th grade. So I, I like I teach that sweet spot where they're just ready to come to school every day, you know. They're in such a great mood; they're prepared to learn. <laughs> Twelve to fourteen, right? Um, but it's it, you know that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. And it's it's as time has gone on, it's become an issue, right? I mean, I have students in my class who deserve to learn, deserve to have an adequate education, and you know when you have one or two students consistently disrupting things in the classroom, on the bus, chronic behaviors, at a certain point, you know, my heart goes out to them if they've had a bad home life, but I also have to look out for the other kids in my room as well. True. Yeah. Eric, uh, somewhere I read, and unfortunately I cannot remember where I read it, was it either with the unions or the uh, mm -hmm. Board of Education or some group said this is a train wreck <clears throat> waiting to happen. Uh, and you allude to that in your letter. You said that there mm -hmm. will be individuals in the administration that will take exception to this, but it was mm -hmm. the the, uh, order, the uh, legislation was written for the teachers and the students. Would you elaborate on that, please? And I think that at the end of the day, that's it. I mean, I, I fully understand the potentiality for, you know, increased, like you put it, administrative burdens, right? But like I said in my article, I mean, respectfully, this legislation was not written to make life convenient for administrators or county board office employees, right? This bill was written to empower classroom teachers who have been dealing with chronic bad behaviors and kind of have thrown their hands up. I mean, when you when the AFT and the WVA last year did statewide listening tours, right? And they scheduled several of them statewide, Beckley, Morgantown, up in Charleston. I'm not sure if they did one up in the EP with you all, but um, the number they asked teachers, right? What's keeping you in your profession? What do you think is causing teachers to leave the profession? And they gave all these options, and number one, categorically, just not even second place wasn't even close. Number one was student behavior and discipline. Well, I'll and so go ahead, Elliot. I'm sorry. Ahead. Yeah, finish your thought. I'm sorry. No, so I mean, it's it's just like I said in the article. I mean, respectfully, this bill was written for teachers, and you know, I know that it may be inconvenient, but we also need to consider the inconveniences that we've been dealing with and our students have been dealing with, and the families of our students that show up to school are ready to learn and are having the educational process for them hindered because of bad behavior. They're, they've been inconvenienced for years. So that's my take on it. And, Elliot, I'll back that up from anecdotal evidence. Uh, my mm -hmm. sister-in-law uh, recently retired from teaching, I think, 25, 30 mm -hmm. years in the classroom, whatever it was. And when I would talk to her about teaching and the stresses that she had, she said the issues were not necessarily the students, but the lack of support she got from the mm -hmm. administration when there was an issue with a student. Because mm -hmm. the, the, the parent uh, in this day and age automatically sides with the kid in most cases. 
And, oh, absolutely. And the administration, which has a set of guidelines that a teacher is trying to enforce, once it gets pressure from a, a parent or the word lawsuit is mentioned, the administration then cuts the ankles out from the teacher and mm -hmm. sweeps it under the rug and lets the teacher deal with it. So the teachers are in a no-win situation where they're trying to enforce something to get ordered in their classroom. They're getting no support from the parent and no support from the administration above them. Oh, yeah, and that's why I keep my union membership active, right? I mean, because they're not perfect. I don't agree with everything that my union espouses, especially at the national level, but I've also seen my local reps step up and, and help members, right, when nobody else would. Sometimes all it takes is a union rep showing up to the board office or the administrator's office and saying, hey, you know, what you're doing doesn't follow the code or what you're asking this teacher to do isn't appropriate and in the in, in, in the code and most of the time that fixes the issue and so that's been beneficial for me in my career and i've also heard anecdotal stories of people dropping their membership because of political feelings or because maybe they were let down in a certain situation i certainly do understand that and respect their feelings in that regard uh, but i mean it's the unfortunate thing is like the story you told you can't a lot of it comes down to the individual administrator or administration in, in, in the schools, right? And I have a great administrator. I have a great working relationship with her. We have an open line of communication. Anytime there are concerns, I may take concerns of other teachers to her. And we always work out of a, a situation that usually every side gives a little bit, but we're all coming away happy, right? Not every building has an administrator that operates that way. And we do live in a lawsuit-happy society. And you put both those things together in a bottle and shake them up, and it becomes an issue. Her um, answer at the age of 55 was yeah. to retire, by the way. Okay, yeah. Bill? Yeah. yeah. Elliot, uh, to refresh the ones that have not uh, her, uh, been current with this law, would you summarize quickly what it is? Yeah, absolutely. This is House Bill 2890. Uh, if anybody wants to look it up on the legislature's website, 2890. And it essentially gives teachers and bus drivers uh, authority to remove a student from the bus or their classroom for any behavior that they deem to be disruptive. And I think that that term they deem is the issue that the State Board of Ed has with it instead of a criteria laid out in the bill. It's up to the individual teacher or bus driver's discretion, right? Uh, but so if they are removed, in that day, they cannot return to the class for the rest of the day. And this is applicable to all students in grades 6 through 12, right? So they removed elementary students from the bill. I'd like to see that put back in. We can discuss that later if you like. Um, but uh, it's if students are removed from the classroom for disruptive behavior, they cannot return to the class that day. Once they do return to the class, the teacher has the right not to accept them back into the class if administration has not provided written documentation of what corrective actions were done. So, and if this happens within three times in a month's period, the student must be suspended or put into an alternative school. There are no other options according to the bill. So let's talk about the logistics of this. If, if I'm mm -hmm. a, a teacher in history class and I've got a disruptive student, do I just say get out of my classroom and, and then it's done? It sounds to me there must be another bureaucratic level to in, into that, if only for the paperwork. Well, and essentially this is where it comes down to, you know, the professionalism of individual teachers and employees, right? And you have to trust the judgment of people who've gone through school and who maybe have been doing this job for years and have a little bit of experience. And it's like anything else, right? I feel like society's view of what's going on in the classrooms, I mean, it's, it's like the same thing with anything else. A few bad apples ruins a bunch. By and large, most of us all, you know, are concerned about our students. We want to teach. And so when, when behavior, for me, you know, I would warn a student several times. I would talk with them one-on-one -on -one and ask them, you know, hey, what's going on? Let's, we need to work this out. And, but once it gets to a certain point, it's, yes, essentially I would be like, you need, you need to leave my class and report to the office. And I will call the office and make sure they made it where they're going. And at that point, it's no longer my responsibility. But that counseling step, 
while it's a step you would take, it's not a step that's required within the law. Is that is that no. what I'm hearing? Yeah, it's not required in the law. It's up to the individual teacher's discretion. And it, if a student's behavior is bad enough, I mean, if it is bad enough and disruptive enough, maybe that counseling step probably should be skipped and they should be sent to the office. Because it's like I said, you know, we have a classroom full of other students who are there to learn. And at a certain point, we do have to look out for them. Has has this been done a few times that you're aware of since since the law has passed? And how has it gone? Is there pushback? So I just, you know, <clears throat> for fear, for legality reasons, I'm I'm not going to speak about instances within my building. Um, you know what I mean? I don't want to cross a line with FERPA or anything like that. So, but yes, it's being done. Uh, I don't know. In my building, there is no pushback, right? Uh, but I don't know that that's the case statewide. Because if I'm having conversations with people and they're not even aware that this is an option to them, you know, are they being told about this? these procedures are they being told about the fact that they're now in, they have some empowerment so to speak to enact discipline in their classrooms and it's that was the whole point of my articles like hey you know I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here but people need to know about this they deserve a right they have a right to know what authority they have now to handle discipline in their classrooms i'm asking for a friend can substitute mm -hmm. teachers do this too my understanding is that this also empowers substitute teachers because they're filling in for – they're standing in the place of the teacher or bus driver. Our producer is a substitute teacher, by the way. No. Oh, Dylan Bishop. My, my hat's off. <laughs> my hat is off yeah. to you. I'm going to bring up Dylan's mic in the newsroom here. Dylan, have you encountered any disciplinary situations, and is it well known in the classrooms where you've been amongst the teachers that this is an option? I, I've never actually had to, as of yet, give out any disciplinary referrals uh, for myself, but uh, I know that it's an option that any time I can go, uh, you know, even if it's not like a physical slip of paper, I can go to an administrator and be like, hey, there was mm -hmm. a problem in the classroom, you know. <clears throat> Are you familiar with this specific law, though? Have you given information about it? I have not been. I have mm -hmm. not been informed about that, no. Okay. No, oh, there's, there's okay. your proof. Yeah. Yeah, well, like I said, it's anecdotal. I don't have the means to take a survey of educational personnel across the state, but my gut feeling is, and anecdotal evidence I have, is that people aren't being told. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, Elliot, uh, looking at the the law, uh, three times during a month, a student is uh, must be placed in either in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, or an alternative learning center, alternative mm -hmm. school. Now, in the eastern panhandle, the alternative centers are fairly abundant. Uh, some of the more rural parts of the state, that's not the case. Uh, what is the uh, alternative if there's not an alternative uh uh, center other than just suspending them and that doesn't do any good for the student yeah when, well the other point is too it also inconveniences the parents or whoever's taking care of that student exactly <clears throat> so the idea is that i guess the impetus would be hey you know we sorry that you're being inconvenienced but maybe you should exercise some steps to maybe get your child under control right so it's, if you do that, maybe you won't be inconvenienced anymore by your kid being home from school. Um, but after a certain amount of suspensions, I mean, at least in Fayette County, they go to a process called ratification, and they have to stand before the Board of Education, and they're asked questions, and the board decides whether or not the students put out of school for the rest of the semester. <clears throat> and so there's like this whole tiered process that occurs. And I do believe that this fits in, too that tiered process very well when it, when a child is suspended uh, for an extended period of time uh, does he have to report or she have to report to a place or do they just kind of get their wish and they don't go to school and they wander around and go to Best Buy well I think that that's an individual county by county policy like in Fayette County we don't have an alternative school like you mentioned before I mean it's we used to and they closed it and the, the reason is funding and staffing, right? But every school district in the state's understaffed. 
it's not – I mean, the, we're dealing with staffing issues down here, and you all are dealing with staffing issues in the Eastern Panhandle. We're dealing with them for very different reasons, um, but we're still dealing with them just the same. And so we don't have an alternative school. So what ends up happening is the kids put out of school, and it, it, I can't speak for other counties, but ours, I mean, the kids put on virtual learning. They're giving assignments to take home, um, and their work – is graded and taken up is miss it's a zero if it's not turned in just like any other student so they're expected to do things while they're gone um once a student has been ratified and put out of school for the semester at least in our county they're required to log into educational software and it's proctored i mean you have to be there on a webcam you know signing in every day visible to the teacher that's proctoring the, the online class if you're not there, you're absent. After a certain amount of absences, you know, you become truant, and then the court system may get involved. So it's this whole leveling of procedures and ramifications. Delegate Elliot Pritt is our guest here on the program. We have a question from one of our audience members. Does this law apply to special needs students? No. no uh, this regular IEP procedures or anything that's in a BIP, behavior plan that would take precedence over this from heather compton so those are, yeah from heather compton i know a teacher that burned out because someone takes the troubled student out for a few minutes and is allowed back in she can't discipline her own class yep and if this teacher had had this option or had this bill at that time if this teacher is still teaching please give them this information because if a student's removed from class they cannot return the rest of the day they cannot if administration tries to send them back, I mean, truthfully, that would probably be grounds for a grievance. And so they don't, you know, that is now no longer the case. As long as the student is in grade 6 to 12, that's what this bill applies to, students in grade 6 through 12. And before we let you go, Elliot, the uh, question had arisen, are you related to Charlotte Pritt? So... <laughs> And, you know, you asked me this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So Charlotte and I do know one another, and we've spoken several times. We are distantly related, uh, but my dad was a foster child. And so really all I know about my own last name is what I was able to look up or find on geneal in genealogy research or websites, things like that. But from what I can tell, I believe we're third cousins. We have a common ancestor, a Pritt. There were three Pritt brothers that came from – Ireland into England in the late 1700s and uh, kind of dispersed throughout what was then the frontier, what is now southern West Virginia, Kanawha, Clay, Fayette Counties. So. And are you related to Delegate Chris Pritt? We are third cousins, yes. <laughs> A lot of third cousins. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know what they say, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, going back but, uh, to Charlotte Pritt very quickly, what is she doing hmm. now? Do you know? Well, I, I do not. Yeah. Uh, I have heard her health's not good, um, so I'm not exactly sure. I don't want to, you know, comment yeah, sure. or spill any I, personal I, details. But she's I so she's so active in the political scene for what uh, mm. several several years and then many just, years. Yeah, many she's years. a good woman too, yeah. a good caring woman. Yeah. I remember interviewing her back in the '90s when she was yeah. running for governor. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Elliot, is great. You to have, awesome. You have any other questions for me? Yeah. What What do you teach? So I teach history. I don't even like to call it social studies, right? My undergraduate degree is in history, <laughs> but uh, my master's degree is in teaching, and I'm actually working on a master's degree in administration, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this may be my problem one day. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like you your know, sense of humor. Yeah, it may be my problem one day, but it's um, – uh, yeah, I teach 7th and 8th grade history, social studies. So I teach early human history, and then I teach West Virginia studies, which I really enjoy. Very nice. And are you a WVEA member or AFT? No, I'm an AFT member. Very good. Hey, it was great to speak with you. I appreciate your time this morning. I appreciate you all having me. I truly do. Thank you. Enjoy your day. You Thanks, too. Thanks, Elliot. Take care. Uh, Take care. No school today in the Eastern Panhandle because of the uh, Columbus Day holiday. Uh, or... If uh, you work for Government Indigenous Peoples Day, too. That's uh, how it's been uh, referred to uh, in many cases here at 832.